The His Girl Friday podcast is brought to you in part by Messenger Fellowship, living the kingdom, fulfilling the call, proclaiming the truth. How's it going, everyone? This is Cameron Fry with His Girl Friday coming at you live on a Friday night. It's five o'clock. It's the beginning of Labor Day weekend, and I am stoked about this stretch of prolonged rest. I hope you guys have some fun, exciting plans ahead. So I'm going to jump right in, in part because this podcast that's being cut right now, it's entirely a redo. And I'm a doofus at times, and uh, Tuesday I cut a pod, um, a Work is Freedom, Hearts of Flesh Part 2, a post that went up on His Girl Friday back on Tuesday, and I was cutting the audio, and there was this noise in the background, just this clinging noise coming from the air vent, and I just didn't realize it. And yeah, I listened to portions and pieces of the audio as I was stitching clips together, but for the most part, it didn't really hit me till after everything published that, oh boy, I'm going to have to take this down at some point. So yeah, there is a there's a a, a clip. Uh, there's an audio file up on SoundCloud and Facebook and YouTube, but those will be replaced uh, shortly. So we're going back to our new series on Hearts of Flesh. Uh, we're talking about work is freedom and using the comparison of Hearts of Flesh to Hearts of Stone to illustrate how this is to look. We talked about work is worship early in the summer, going back to creation and uh, John, the Word of God, and what God intends for our work, how it looks like as a, a fragrant offering to him, being faithful with what he's given us as a way of leading people to Jesus and showing his love. We're taking maybe a 45 degree turn from that. It's not a completely different uh, topic altogether. It's really just chapter two. If if work is worship was chapter one, this is chapter two. So it's building, these series build on top of one another and even within each series, there's a part one, there's an introductory post. And what I like to do with those introductory posts is lay some core principles down as foundation, some scriptures, uh, a bedrock of scriptures, so that we make the absolute truth known and everything else we talk about, like tonight, the application side of things, is that it finds its way back into the Word of God, the absolutes, what can't be changed. So... I love discussing theology. It has its place, but if the gospel principle isn't clear, if it's not tangible or if it's ambiguous, then you have to wonder, is there a better way of talking about it? Um, are we fully taking it to heart? Are we drilling down as deeply as we need to be? So that's the goal of these posts, and that's why sometimes I'll do a part two, part three, because you want to talk about something that is deep in the heart of God, deep in the Word, and then find uh, something that is maybe uh, 30, 40,000 feet up, and you have to bring it down to the surface into what we experience day in and day out as individuals, as those who work, um, and hopefully those who work into the Lord. And so we have to get real with ourselves. And to do that, we just have to look at what we're encountering at the surface level. So I think we can all agree we live in a complicated world plagued by complicated systems, systems of hurry, um, systems of merit, reciprocity, self-effort, performance. Um, and within those systems, we're, as mentioned, addicted to the hustle bustle, our ideas of success, high expectations, uh, idolatries, whether we realize them or not, uh, self-fulfillment, gratification, etc. Yeah, we want well, we mean well, we work well, but by day's end, it sure seems like we're plagued by a lot of negatives and positives. It sure seems like there's a lot weighing on our hearts on us emotionally and sometimes you just got to pause and ask yourself why is that why is it for instance that there are a lot of people who um, go to bed each night and they think about not the great things that happened to the day the fact that they have a roof over their head a bed to sleep in and uh, friends and family but you know they think about that one thing they could have done differently that may have changed the outcome of the day or maybe just how you feel about the day some of us, we think about this in broader terms. What is the, if there's one thing that we could correct about ourselves, what would it be? Because these things, they don't exist in vacuums. 
there's a domino effect, right? That if, if I was, say, more of an introvert, there would be repercussions, implications. Maybe I'd have more friends. Maybe I'd have more friends who would want to spend time with me, and maybe I wouldn't feel as lonely, etc. I'm, I'm giving an example here. So I think a lot of us, we think about those voids, uh, and we want to try and make sense of them, so we kind of can control the script a little bit. We can at least say, you know what, I don't like this about myself, but at least I understand why. We don't really turn to the Lord, we're relying on ourselves. And we take that same posture and attitude into the workforce. And that's why a lot of us, we're discouraged by some of the funk that we experience all the time, whether it's secondhand or something that we contribute to firsthand. But I also know at the core of many prevalent issues are hearts of stone burdened by systems of performance and self-effort. Um, and I know I mentioned other systems, but we're going to focus on performance and self-effort tonight. And this is no more evident than our cultural idolization of individual accomplishment over collective partnership. As a society, we say we value collaboration and teamwork and leadership, but in an I must get this done age, can we honestly say our bottom line is more done than I? I honestly think that while we have the heart, we we have the desire to achieve things, to um, work as a means of excellence, or to demonstrate the fact that we care about what we do. I think a lot of us were still caught up in progress and status and standing, and we've lost the point of why we work all together. Regardless of where you're at individually or organizationally, um, again, going back to part one, there's a common thread that we can adhere to, and that is this. By aligning ourselves to God, we can know not only is our salvation secure for those who believe, but our purpose, our, our destiny, and our future as well. And this has massive implications in the marketplace. For starters, we can know our work and enjoy our work free from those worldly systems, which, left to our devices, could lead us to places of offense, of agenda, anxiety, fear. And the reason why is because our idea of success is rooted in affirmation and accomplishment. But when we realize that um, to God, his idea of success is rooted in worship, completion, fullness, it is finished, that changes the narrative entirely. A lot of us, we worry day in and day out about our voice being heard or if X project will get done. Or, you know, sometimes we just want to take everything um, into our own hands so that we can get things done faster and we can find time to do what we really want to do to feel good about ourselves. We do that to counter feelings of being trapped, knowing that, you know, Got to get that paycheck or, you know, I need to advance in order to, um, again, accomplish this goal that I've set for myself. And But I can't do that with the, certain, the current metrics in place. And there's just a lot of different things. Like, we're so burdened by what we can't control. And there's a lot that we're supposed to, I mean, in everything, we're supposed to rely on God and surrender to Him. So that's my first thing is dare to rely on God as your higher power in those moments. Put into practice um, this heart posture that will free you from insecurity and redirect this fear of man and failure to a fear of the Lord. I love what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12 uh, verses 11 and 13 in the English Standard. The words of the wise are like goods and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Now a lot of us, we might have forgotten this passage in Ecclesiastes, not commonly referenced, but I love what Solomon is saying here. There's a beginning and end to all that we experience, but fearing the Lord, that is wise work at its core. God has given us responsibility, and the fear of the Lord is not supposed to be detached from it. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but God is the giver of wisdom, and that's supposed to be reflected in the quality of our work. So excellence, yes, has its place, but we have to know that there is one shepherd, there is one giver, there's one maker, one creator, and we're ultimately doing this for him, not for anyone else, not for anything else. And we build on that. When we surrender our anxieties and we cast our cares upon the Lord, we create space God can invade, and this is a powerful word that I want you guys to remember. Uh, if, if you don't get anything else out of tonight, I want you guys to get this, and that is we create we can create space God can invade. And when I say we create, I'm not saying that we control the script. Like we receive from the Lord. And as we receive from him, 
as we rely and align to him, that is how space happens. <laughs> space that God can invade. So now let's look at 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9 in the message. And so, yeah, in context, this is kind of different because there's a little bit of end times in the script, but um, I think we could find some real life application here too. So don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. God isn't late with his promise to some measure of lateness. He's giving everyone space and time to change. Now in context, this is, um, you know, talking about in the end times, God's going to give everyone a chance to turn to Jesus and give their hearts to him. Um, but so there's like the uh, revelation side of this in play here. But there's also the daily aspect where every day when we begin, we could thank God. And that's one of my favorite things to talk about is starting each day with gratitude, because that's the, one of the first things we could do that we give God space to invade. And there may be things we want to surrender. Uh, we we want to change. Um, and maybe the surrender is the hard part here. But I think gratitude and well, I know gratitude and thanksgiving is a vehicle to get us there. With you know, with God, one day is as good as a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. What is time to God? He is outside of time, clearly. But that's that should encourage us. We're so bound by the clock. We're so bound by our parameters and our limitations and our finiteness. God is always on time, and He's always working for us. And that that aspect of God's nature, it's like nothing takes Him by surprise, and there's nothing that He does that's a mistake. We may not understand, but it doesn't mean that God is not being faithful behind the scenes. Uh, but unfortunately for many of us, these scriptures, these realities, they fall flat before we recognize them. And, you know, we may pray before each day, we ingest truth of the word, and still we feel plagued by those negatives, that emotional gravity that's um, just rooted in conflict. And dare to wonder, why is that? So I want to share a story going back to my college days, or rather after I graduated college. I was looking for work, and as I was kind of trying to transition from a student to uh, a workplace worker, I would feel guilty if I had time to kill or margins to clear. I think to myself, I must be doing something wrong if I'm not being productive or if I'm not on on the go all the time, and I just wanted to get things done. I wanted to make a name for myself. I wanted to at least begin the the process of being as independent as I possibly could be, and Side note, there are two reality filters in life, intimacy and independence. And systems of the world, I mean, you could root them all um, in independence, <laughs> whereas we were created for dependence. And so I had this independent mindset, and it really stressed me out. I mean, I didn't really make a lot of quality relationships because I didn't really make time. I wasn't making time for those relationships, but you could trace it back even further. I wasn't making time for God. I was trying to take things in my own hands. And then, yeah, I, I you know, would go to church and I had faith, uh, but it was compromised because it was compartmentalized. Um, uh, wow, that's a, put that on a t-shirt, right? Or a mug. So looking back, I realized this burden was self-inflicted because I believed that if I didn't have a mountain to conquer, I was doing something wrong. I was being faithless. But now I know that voids created through surrender is an apex of spiritual maturity. More specifically, to create voids righteously, one must repent and acknowledge God as the provider of opportunity and the way to resolution and the sustenance when either is lacking. So, yeah, we all have different margins and capacities. Just look at the parable of the talents. Some of us can, you know, we could tackle a lot of things at once. Some of us, we are, we're more single folk, and that's okay. We may not be able to get as much done, say, as someone else who has more things to juggle, but... Since God is the giver, it doesn't matter if we're juggling two things, five things, ten things, twenty things, whatever. It's all about experiencing work as freedom, knowing that God entrusts us with what he gives us, um, and being able to impact our workspace because we've allowed, we've already given space to God within our hearts. So how that looks at the surface, we could view business, ethics, strategies, accountability, communication, motivation, all as fragrant offerings to God. Furthermore, if we accept our future as known and predetermined rather than unknown and self-determined, we can view our work as done since our purpose is already secure. So I know I talked about that in part one, but I want to come back to it to, so we can build upon it um, in application. So it's an idea that may be hard to grasp at first. 
I'm not saying you approach responsibility with a cavalier attitude. However, I am encouraging you uh, to see aligning to God as a way we daily engage His fullness, His faithfulness, and the belief that what good can be done will be done. It's not about the bottom line or the finish line with God. It's about the finished line. The finished work on the cross, tied to your finished you, the Holy Spirit who's painting you, the finished you on a canvas. He's not capturing where you're at now. He's capturing the finished you, and that finished you can't get any better. If it helps, consider this. You are a new creation. You're being made a new creation. That's a past and present and future thing. To be made is to have an identity. What you do is not your identity. So what you make and what you earn is not your identity. So what is your identity? It's who you are. God. God made you who you are. The source of identity. He also made work. Why? So people can know him and discover their purpose. Hence why work isn't your identity, but working into the Lord is. And there's more. Knowing God is why we work means he's the subject of our work. And our co-workers and our supervisors, they are not the subject. They are the object, like us. We're equal in value, diverse in function. Even the confusing characters out there, those who think success is all about profit, position, and power. God sees the finish them. Not only what they could be, but what they will be. And we can be a part. When we talk about partnering with God in his ministry of reconciliation, we're talking about how we stitch together those two why we're so passionate about bridging faith and work, uh, sacred and secular, it all goes back to helping people see that God is love and that God loves them and that he has a unique plan and purpose for their lives. So it's not about what they could be. God doesn't just, he's not confined in the realm of the potential, but it's all about what he knows will be an absolute attribute of God that ties to an absolute truth. We can know about him. So in light of this, we can embrace helplessness. We can accept weakness through being dependent on the Lord, embracing dependence, knowing that we're a new creation, all because of God, for God, continually transformed as we receive, given, not just giving out and putting out, but receiving as we give, um, or receive in order to give, rather, from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So even when others condescend on weakness, they look down on it. They wish they could... Um, in fact, I actually want to pause here because I just had this revelation on Wednesday night, uh, a day after I published this. So like I said earlier in this, uh, in this pod, two reality filters, intimacy and independence, when it, how it looks like when we approach weakness. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, to kind of sum it up, he's talking about why we shouldn't view strength as the absence of weakness, where we're just trying to eradicate it. That's how we get into some legalistic territory within the church. But to God, strength is the weakness because the cross has meaning. It doesn't mean we tolerate our sin and keep sinning. But it means that we are constantly dependent on him. It's what keeps us in that aligning place, posture, if you will. So a lot of us see his strength as something that's that we're improving we're refining, but it's all about aligning. And aligning all goes back to that spirit of dependence. So there's a right way to view weakness. And if we could do it to ourselves, I think we're meant, I know we're meant to do it to one another. We don't get caught up in how someone is, but how they could be. Imagine your coworkers and your supervisors and your clients through the lens of what would they be like if they had Jesus in their life? How would the culture change if I was courageous and bold with the truth? And how I demonstrated love and how I died to myself each day in order to make way, to make that space for God to invade and then to start to transform the culture through me. How sweet it is to know that that same wonder-working power on the cross can be alive in and through us even as we work. It's meant to happen at all times, not just when we're off the clock. So, all that said, next time you're at work, delight in the fact you could be open to constructive criticism or anything you're said uh, or, or you're told. Since work is more than learning, it's freedom. It's not just a, a long-term collection of uh, insight, experiences, uh, training. It's meant to be worship. It's meant to be freedom at its core. So when you're micromanaged, manipulated, or indirectly communicated to, you could rejoice because God hasn't given you a spirit of fear of what your boss or colleagues can do to you, but of love, power, and a sound mind and what you can give back. 
Again, if you align to Christ, if you commit to doing that as part of your daily walk, your daily mindset, the reproach, the dying to self, being able to live an integral life, all this will take care of itself because it becomes an overflow. The fruits of the Spirit, overflow. Besides, you can't control what others do or think, but you can trust in God who works all things for good and is progressively transforming us into his image. Because again, to God, it's not about the bottom line or even the finish line. It's about the finished line, a reality we can know as Christ's finished work alive in us. I close with this verse from 2 Peter one, uh, chapter 1, 8-11, through 11, the message. With these qualities active and growing in our life, no grass will grow under your feet, no day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you, His choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you'll have your life on a firm footing, the streets paved and the way wide open into the eternal kingdom of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so I could almost preach from this right now, but I'm going to come back to it next time in part three. There's something to think about that Jesus is the reward that you can mature in your experience of our Lord, but that that maturation is not about, again, what we do in our own strength through self-betterment, but maturing through aligning as we align ourselves to that finished product, that finished us. There's qualities, there's things that we, um, we want to focus on to become like Christ, and that's good, but a lot of times we lose sight of the cross in our lives. Um, we forget that God has paid it all. We've been redeemed and forgiven. You know, the old sinful life has been wiped off the books. We still think it's in the book. We still think we have to prove ourselves. Um, and then we get distracted from not, not only inviting others into a, a loving culture, but God's own invitation for us. There's a choice that he makes of you. And I feel like it's like, well, God doesn't have a choice. He's God, but he has a choice. He has that. That's why we have free will. So, anywho, I could go on, but I don't want to ramble. Thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions on this, anything you want to comment on, feel free to, to drop us a line. Next time, we'll discuss how merging bottom lines with finished lines sets the stage for cultural transformation um, in our workplaces. Uh, but till then, again, be refreshed. Enjoy the holiday weekend, and I'll try and get another post up here in a couple weeks. As I always say, I'll catch you on the fry. Peace.